Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lesbian Talk Shows for Love and Money. I'm your host, Rady Magden, and today we have a very special guest who I'm excited to talk to, Hildred Billings. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show this week. Uh, thank you for having me. It's my first time doing a podcast. <laughs> Well, that's exciting. I'm really honored that you chose For Love and Money, and I hope it's going to be a fun experience for both of us. Um, so when we were having our email exchange about what we wanted to talk about for the podcast, um, you brought up some really interesting stuff about tropes, and that got the gears in my head turning, to be honest, because I love tropes, <laughs> and I do think that they can help sell books and sell you as an author. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Tell me what you think a trope is in the context of this conversation and how you've used them. Okay, well, when I'm talking about tropes, I'm specifically talking in genre fiction. And in my case, that would be romance in the sub-niche of lesbian romance, which has all their own sub-niches, as you know. But let's just talk generally in the cloud of lesbian romance or romance if you want, contemporary romance. There, here we go, contemporary romance. <laughs> but um, so tropes are the things that sort of define your book. They are the things that your readers look at your blurb, they look at your cover, they look at your title and they go, this is the book I want to read and this is why. And it's usually because of the trope you have presented in your book. Like for example, my latest major release with um, Cindy, Cynthia Dane, was called Bad Girl Love, and I put the trope right in the title, <laughs> <laughs> the bad girl trope. Um, I, didn't, I didn't go for the virgin angle. That's very common in bad boy, bad girl tropes, is to have their foil be completely inexperienced, completely new to this whole, you know, having sex thing. But in this case, I decided to go with someone with a little bit of experience, but she was brand new to the whole, you know, getting with somebody outside of my class, you know, the person from the wrong side of the tracks. And right there, I just listed three different tropes. <laughs> and I, th um, the reason why I kind of harp about tropes in writing groups is because there is a big stigma against them. And it's something that's ingrained in literary society because tropes are associated with genre fiction, even though you could pick up any, you know, so-called quote unquote literary fiction title and you will still find tropes in there because we are human we like to categorize things it makes our brains happy and we pick the tropes that we like and we gravitate toward them and as an author I think it's partly my job especially if I want to make a full-time living at this to understand the tropes that I like the tropes that my readers like the tropes that are kind of trendy right now you know so I can maximize my uh production time so I'm writing something that I think will at least be a money maker for the rest of the year or the next couple of years. Personally I love tropes. I love diving into them and using them in my own work and there's this misconception like you said that tropes are a bad thing that they make a book boring but like I found it's totally the opposite. They're what gives the book flavor and life and I I love them. So uh, you mentioned trendy tropes uh, and following certain trends. What trends have you noticed in lesfic specifically that have been very popular recently? Oh man, I don't. Do I even have to say it? Fake girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, no. I was. I I didn't get into that one on purpose. I wrote a book. God, I can't. They all blur together. Was it last year? I think, um, or two years ago. Kiss. It had to been two years ago. Kiss and Tell came out. And it was a fake, well, I took it from fake boyfriend over from my contemporary MF writing career as Cynthia Dane and translated it over to lesbian fiction. I want to see if fake girlfriend would work, if my readers would like it. Had not read a fake girlfriend book yet in lesbic. And I'm not saying I was doing anything totally original. It's just how my brain was turning the gears, so to speak, and going, oh, that could be fun. And so I presented that to the world. It was a big hit. People were recommending it everywhere. And next thing I knew, I, I, I this is going to sound really bad, but I have not read Casting Lacey yet. <laughs> And I hear that's a that's a fake girlfriend book, and that's probably like one of the biggest titles from last year, if I'm correct. And yeah, I'm seeing a lot of it. I'm seeing a lot of people saying that they want more of those kinds of books right now. And I think it was 
oh god apologies if i'm saying her name wrong but jay 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 yeah she had her a lesbian yeah jay she had her um lesbian book bingo and i think one of the results she put out just last month at the end of it where she listed the most popular tropes that people told her about it was like doctor veterinarian and fake girlfriend and military <laughs> So that right there is a nice font of uh, inspiration. You just have a, you know, have your vet become the fake, the fake girlfriend of the town doctor, and now they join the military, and it's all good. <laughs> That's like <laughs> the cool thing about tropes, though, because they overlap and like link together, and then you can combine mm -hmm. them in all sorts of interesting ways. Yeah, and some of them naturally go together. Like I have my um, background in billionaire romance, both. Um, well, that's Cynthia Dane's whole brand, and that's another subject entirely is building pen names around trope brands. But, um, well, actually, billionaire romance is a subgenre of contemporary romance, and the tropes are what help make it, because the central trope in billionaire romance is the Cinderella story, which is a trope in itself. You know, poor girl is destitute, but she has a heart of gold, and she's trying to help her family, trying to keep her pets alive, and nothing ever seems to cobble together month to month, and suddenly... Here's, you know, Prince or Princess Charming with all the money and all the connections who comes in and saves the day. And that's the fantasy is that it's like, I call it the millennial fantasy. <laughs> oh my God, that hurts. <laughs> that's, that's, that's it's true. true. It's like, we sit here going, oh, capitalism's bad, you know, eat the rich. And then we go and we read our billionaire romances going, God, in my little corner of my head, it's perfect. <laughs> I feel really called but, out yeah, right so now. Excuse you. <laughs> Well, I'm, that's my job is to call people out in my books going, you like this, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, and so in Billionaire Romance, we have the two conjoined tropes that go together very well, which is usually, you know, enemies to lovers and forced proximity. Because, you know, how do you get an enemy to lovers trope happening? It's usually through forced proximity, which is another trope. I am. Yeah, throw them in a the cabin together. <laughs> I was just gonna say I'm a huge enemies to lovers sucker I do it whenever I can in my mm -hmm. books I mean I also like friends to lovers I my favorite is enemies to friends mm -hmm. to lovers actually mm -hmm. no my favorite is friends to lovers to enemies to back to lovers <laughs> well yeah because you have to have those you know you got to hit the beats <laughs> yeah um okay so can we can yeah. we talk about tropes in relationship to pacing and how the tropes you choose can influence the pacing of your, your book and how that can, like, make light bulbs in readers' heads go off. Yeah, because um, I, I was just thinking about this yesterday. The more tropes you choose, especially tropes that may not naturally occur together, like I just said, enemies to lovers and forced proximity, which right there is your plot. <laughs> but um, the more tropes you choose to put together into your genre soup, so to speak, the longer your book is probably going to end up being because you're going to be introducing more subplots, more characters to carry out these subplots. And it's something you have to keep in mind when you sit down to plot. I naturally write very long, <laughs> very meaty stories, uh, anywhere between 70,000 to 130,000 words. And it's usually because I'm, I usually have the central trope that I market my book on, but then there's the other tropes that make up the genre soup, so to speak. So that's one thing to keep in mind. I recently just am launching this year a new series of novella a month set in the same small town. It's going to be called A Year in Paradise. Uh, <laughs> market drop right there. <laughs> and um, so each each book takes place during the month of the year, and each book will have a central trope to it. And I had to sit down and really force myself to stick to one trope. So I didn't go out of my word count because if I wrote the same length of book that I usually write, I wouldn't be able to put out one a month. They would no longer be novellas. They would be epic novels, which always happens to me. So <laughs> I had to really challenge myself to sit down and just do the one trope per book. And if I really want to, I can weave subplots in between the different interconnected books. That sounds so fascinating. I've never heard of someone writing like a year long thing where a new short story is coming out mm -hmm. every month based on the month, based on a trope. That's so incredibly creative. And that's such a great way to keep reader engagement through the whole year. I mean, they're never going to like stop thinking about <laughs> you. That's brilliant. I love it. I hope so. That's the plan. 
So it's a small town romance subgenre, which is also really big in contemporary romance in general. But again, that's subgenre that's made up of other tropes. And the big major trope you usually see in small town romances is the one I use for book one to introduce the town and the townspeople. And it's, you know, the native girl who grew up, moved away, broke some hearts behind her, and then has to return for whatever reason and face her ex. Like a Hallmark movie. Kind of, except with, you know, more cursing and more sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a system that really works for them, apparently. Well, yeah, it's popular, especially around the holidays. But, um, yeah, that's that's so brilliant. I can't get over that. Can you pre-order them? Is there a way to, like, pre-order the, the year-long thing and then they'll get delivered to you when they come out? No, I, I don't do pre-orders simply because, one, I don't trust Amazon. <laughs> And two, I I like to give myself a little wiggle wiggle room, but I also have proven to myself and my readers that I can get books out. When I say there's going to be a book a month, there will be a book a month short of me getting like mononucleosis, knock on wood. (laughs) But the first book is called January Embers, and it will be out as of recording this this Friday, the 11th, January 11th. And I'm hoping to have the others out within the first two weeks of their month. So you can just pick it up, read it, enjoy it during the month that it's set. And I'll see you at Christmas time for the big Christmas novella. (laughs) That's great. I will absolutely link to that when this podcast comes out because it'll be shortly after that. So I can throw a link in the show notes so people can go buy it. And and it will be in KU. So for those who uh, don't like paying for novellas, there you go. By KU, you mean Kindle Unlimited? Yeah, Kindle Unlimited. Have you had success with putting some of your stuff on Kindle Unlimited? I'm I'm curious because I've heard different opinions from different authors about whether it's worth it or not. It's worth it to me because, like I just said, I write big, meaty books, so that's a lot of page reads. But that that only works if you can keep your readers hooked for the whole length of the book. <laughs> so I put out 120,000 word novels on average 100 to 120,000 words. I think Bad Girl Love was about 100 120,000 words. And it's, you know, they use they make me they make me a good amount of money for a few months without much promo. It's very nice. <laughs> You're listening to the Lesbian Talk Show. The lesbiantalkshow.com, your hub of podcast information. How do you sustain the fuel and the fire of these tropes throughout 120,000 words. Uh, what what tricks do you have to keep the tension and the suspense going for that long? Oh, I'm, I'm just wordy. <laughs> um, I, I do use a lot of subplots in my books because that's just how my brain turns it. I, I throw these characters together and the next thing I know she's this one wants to escape her past and this one is trying to embrace her future and then their worlds collide and that creates all usually what happens is I'll sit down to write a book go oh this will probably end up being around 70,000 words and by the time I reach 110,000 words I go where is the end <laughs> so I can't really say how exactly my books end up this long other than I write very long sex scenes, which probably helps, <laughs> <laughs> and to flesh them out a bit, because these are technically erotic romances. So readers come expecting some hot sex, and that's what I try to deliver. Well, that's what I come to when I'm trying to find a romance novel, so <laughs> cheers. Um, okay, that's, a, that's another one. Um, what are some of your favorite tropes surrounding sex and erotica, now that we're on the subject? Ooh, well, what's popular? I, I mean, obviously, enemies to lovers will never die. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm sorry. I have to say I'm sorry to my girlfriend because she hates that trope so badly. <laughs> Why? So I, uh, she's of the opinion that if you hate somebody, there's a reason. <laughs> I'm like, that's right, well, honey. I mean... but, but the whole point is in fiction is that it's an it's a redeemable reason. Obviously, yes, it's if, a redeemable if, reason. You, know, you don't hate someone just because they're awful. That'd be a terrible mm-hmm. book. If Mr. Uh, real Estate Developer is running around kicking puppies on his way to demolish your grandmother's home, he's probably not very redeemable in Enemies to Lovers. There's probably a good reason you hate that guy. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if he's 
oh, well, nobody's living here and it's considered a health hazard, but it's, you know, also a historical monument and that's why people are up in arms. Well, I still have to do my job. It's going to hurt people, blah, blah, blah. And now here comes, you know, the local, uh, the local community authority going, no, 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 I can't let you knock this down. This this house means a lot to us. People got married here. They had babies here, blah, blah, blah. And that's when their worlds collide because they think the other, it comes down to, they think the other person is wrong. You have to give both sides. And that's where the conflict. Yeah, you have to give both sides equal weight and make them like, make the reader see both points of view or else it just seems like one is bad. Yeah, that's a hard one to pull off with only one point of view because you really need to get into the head of the quote unquote opposition. I don't think I've read many enemies to lovers books where there aren't multiple points of view. I'm sure they're out there and I'm sure there's some that are done very well, but like you, I don't think I've ever come across one that was the central trope was enemies to lovers. Yeah, it seems like you'd just be making it harder on yourself when you wouldn't really need to. I'm sure they're out there though. Yeah. So uh, back to back to erotic tropes. What other erotic tropes have you found sell really well and resonate with readers? Well, we already talked about fake girlfriend and but that's coming from another angle because the whole thing about fake girlfriend is that, oh, we're just pretending to be together, but deep down we really want each other. <laughs> so it's again it's that simmering sort of lust for one another because I'm talking about erotic romance so sex and lust are on the table whereas in sweeter romances you're building up toward like the kiss at the end but in my in my books it's it follows more of the pattern of we shouldn't be doing this oh but oh my god it's so good that kind of like forbidden feeling and then they decide oh we can't do that again because it will it will trash what we're trying to accomplish in the meta of the story or we're really not good for each other, so we got that out of our systems, only we need to do it again and again and again, and finally we admit that we're in love. <laughs> oh my gosh, she used one of my favorite tropes. My favorite trope possibly to write ever in terms of erotic tropes is two people having sex before it's a good idea and then regretting it and then getting back together. <laughs> I mean, that's my whole career right there. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I need to read everything you've written now because that is my favorite trope. Like everyone loves the slow burn. Everyone's all about the slow burn. Oh, Oh, the tension. And I'm like, I want them to have sex and then have feelings about it. I often, I often read on the bus. That's my writing, my, my, I hope that's not my writing time, my reading time. And a lot of times I end up with these slow burn romances. I'm just sitting there really wanting to scream, fuck already. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god yes <laughs> i feel like we we're hive mind right now it's great <laughs> i mean obviously it works because i kept reading waiting for it to happen yeah uh do you have a fanfic background i gotta ask because like tropes and fan fiction always go together you know i've never written or read fan fiction in my life oh my gosh <laughs> if you like tropes i recommend picking up a fan fiction or two on archive of our own because like you know that's what it's all about i i hear a lot that's i hear a lot about that but i'm not really media i i'm I'm not really connected to a lot of pop culture media like that so it kind of flies right over my head well that's fair you're creating your own stuff out there yeah that's how i got into it i was tired of everything else sucking so i started making my own (laughs) (laughs) i can relate to that that. i was a real pretentious little kid (laughs) Okay, well, we're coming up on 20 minutes. This has been a whole lot of fun. This has been an absolutely fabulous conversation. I only have one more question before mm-hmm. we have to go, and it's a little bit unrelated to tropes. Uh, you sure. are a bit of a Facebook marketing guru, so I've heard through the grapevine. Oh, oh, no. uh, <laughs> what is your... you? Well, I'm, I'm not that familiar with Facebook. I put all my eggs in the Tumblr basket before they banned not safe for work content. And now I'm having to go to Twitter and Facebook and up my presence there. So what are your recommendations for authors who want to up their presence on Facebook and make good use of it? Well, just for the record, we're not talking like um, Facebook ads or that kind of marketing. We're talking like the, uh, the groups, right? Yeah. Yeah. Any, so, anything to do with Facebook, is, really. But I was thinking yeah. less the paid ads and more the attracting followers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I have a private Facebook group, both for just Cynthia and for Cynthia and Hildred. That way I can divide my MF and my lesfic. There, There is some cross-pollination, which always surprises me. 
But um, so the thing about groups versus pages is that pages are kind of worthless right now unless you need to have an ads account, basically, because you have to have an a page to do ads on Facebook. But they've really lost their effectiveness. You basically have to pay to get your post shown to people who follow your page. So even if they follow your page, they're not going to see your post unless you pay for them to see it. And it's just ridiculous. So the nice thing about groups is that they're a lot easier for viewers to see. The more you interact with the group, the more it shows up on your feed and you start getting notifications about it. Because I have noticed that when I post something to my group, the same few people tend to show up within 10 minutes, regardless of the time of day. So that to me is saying that they just got a notification on their phone or in their web browser that says, Hildred just posted to the back room parlor. You want to go see it? We hear you like that group. <laughs> So um, the thing about these Facebook groups is that I make them secret, so not just anybody can join. Yeah, so the groups are private, but I link to them in the back of every book and in the front, I think, sometimes. So it's an, it's an open secret kind of thing. And the nice thing about the closed group is that it allows me as the administrator to filter who's joining so I can keep out, you know, the trolls and in this case, like the lesbian fetishes because they try to get in sometimes and I can spot them a mile away. <laughs> and um, I think it also, especially in a subgenre like lesbian fiction where you might have a lot of people are using their real names on Facebook because that's what they want you to do. And some people might still be in the closet or they don't want the fact that they join, you know, lesbian topia group to show up on their friends' feeds. <laughs> so the nice thing about the secret closed groups is that they don't they don't do that, as far as I know. So it kind of creates this um this private, kind of down to earth atmosphere where where the members can feel a little better about participating. I'm not I'm not asking any like risque questions because I'm, I'm not, <laughs> but just, just being able to say, oh, what was your favorite book of mine this year? And I think it creates this atmosphere where it's a little more trusting. And I've been noticing more and more authors have started to do this. And I think it's a great idea because readers who have a Facebook account can just join. And of course, if your readers don't have Facebook accounts, you might try other avenues that I'm not familiar with because I'm at the point in my career where I just want to focus on one or two social media accounts at a time. So I focus on Facebook and to a lesser extent, Instagram, which isn't so much about um, engagement like it is on Facebook as just kind of keeping a presence. And the things you can post in your groups, like they're a great way to get marketing research done. Like I'll throw, I, I have thrown out polls that are just a list of tropes asking my readers to vote on what trope they'd like to see next. That's great. I You've blown my mind a little bit because I will admit, because of my age, I am less of a Facebook aficionado. And I, as I said before, put all my eggs in the Tumblr basket. So now that Tumblr is gone. I, I was trying to do Tumblr. I've, I've been doing this for about six and a half years now. And way back in the day when I started in 2012, I tried the Tumblr thing. But I just, my thing about Tumblr losers is they ain't putting their money where their mouth is. <laughs> You know, that's true. Sort of Lots of them are too. poor, poor young people who don't necessarily have the money to buy stuff they want to support, or they just are cheapskates. You know, both are probably true. Yeah. Yeah. But, it's, uh, it, I feel like Tumblr is more about putting on the show of what you support than actually supporting it. Yeah, it's really performative, but that's all changing yeah. now. So um, I'm going to make a group on Facebook for Rady Magden because I don't have one. I yeah. was using my I, page, which was apparently not the right way to do it. So thank you. I honestly would not be on Facebook probably at all if it wasn't such a core part of my business. And because I occasionally do ads, but that's neither here or there. But I mostly go on there to interact with my readers once a day, once every other day. Either just posting teasers, you know, snippets, or posting a, a video, or asking them who would they cast as this character, or you know, do like a week. Oh, that's a good one. Do a weekly. What are you reading? Post. Here's what I'm reading this week. Except I don't get to read as often as I used to, so I I don't do that one as much. So uh, I just have to make a quick note before we say goodbye. Did you publish your first novel in 2012? Yes. 
late 2012. We published our first novels in the same year. Yay! <laughs> Yay! I'm so old and jaded. <laughs> Oh my gosh, me too. <laughs> Especially because lots of my reader base is younger, so like, <laughs> I feel old and I feel responsible for them. Uh, uh, okay. All right. <laughs> it is uh, unfortunately time to say goodbye, but I'm grateful for the time we had. This was a wonderful conversation. I had so much fun. Thanks. Thank you me too. so much for being on the show and talking about your work. I will add all of the links I can to your stuff in the show notes, so everyone listening, you should definitely go check out Hildred Billings' work. What pen names do you write under? Um, like, list them all. I, I'm i active as Hildred Billings and Cynthia Dane. Cynthia is the um, MF fiction billionaire romance, and I also co-write together lesbian billionaire romances with her. Quote, unquote, her. Also, me. <laughs> <laughs> and they're usually set in Cynthia Dane's billionaire universe, so that's the crossover. And I've just completely populated that poor universe with a lot of hot single lesbians. It's so tragic, let me tell you. Where are they? <laughs> Where are these hot single billionaire this lesbians? Because I, I want to meet them. We're fantasizing. <laughs> <laughs> and oh my gosh. Hildred, I just, um, my Hildred brand is mostly just whatever genre it is, whether it's fantasy or romance, mostly romance, but sometimes more literary type romances. There's going to be lesbian characters in it. Hooray! <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. This is fun. You're listening to the Lesbian Talk Shows for Love and Money with Ray D. Magden and special guest Hildred Billings. Today we talked about how tropes can add fuel to the fire of your fiction, and we talked about how Facebook groups can enhance your presence in social media. If you want to interact more with the Lesbian Talk Show, please check out our Facebook group <laughs> right there. Um, and uh, talk to other listeners. Um, and also, please check out our Patreon page where you can hear exclusive clips that don't get posted on the regular podcast site. Thank you so much, and we will see you in two weeks.